Hello and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blacksland and today I'm joined by Professor Geraint Harvey, Professor of People and Organisation in the Business Department at Swansea University's School of Management. His research explores changes to employment relationships and the development of the gig economy. He focuses primarily on the nature of employment in the airline industry and the fitness industry. Garrett Harvey, who uh, is always known as Harvey, so I shall call you Harvey, uh, welcome to uh, Exploring Global Problems. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, Sam. Before we really get going, could you just give us an overview of your career? How have you ended up here at Swansea? Uh, Convoluted. Um, Started a degree, dropped out early, um, left, did a variety of jobs, went back, studied again. Uh, finished, took up uh, another series of jobs, no connection between them. I worked in telesales, um, refuse collection. I'd still be doing that now if it paid more. Great job, you know, <laughs> fresh air, exercise, fantastic. Um, went back to study a master's uh, after a, a business venture failed um, and didn't leave after that. So did a master's PhD and um, came to Swansea University as my first lecture in post. And what is your research about? What do you do here? Um, I'm interested in the changing nature of employment, uh, changing nature of work, how it affects employees' lives, you know, how um, it, the economic factors involved, uh, particularly interested in the way in which jobs are changing, um, deteriorating, becoming worse. Um, and one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is the way in which commercial contracts are, are coming to replace employment contracts um, in, in a variety of jobs which have traditionally been seen as, as long-term um, prospects for employees. So can we just unpick that a little bit? What's um, What do we mean when we say commercial contracts uh, replacing employment contracts? What's the nuts and bolts here? Okay, so the employment contract comes with a series of guarantees for the employees, um, particularly um, the sort of additional payments. If, if somebody is sick, they're, they're paid for that time uh, within reason. There's holiday pay, there's guarantees to continued employment. Now, obviously, this comes at a cost to the organisation, a cost to the firm. And so what we've seen, um, particularly um, after the global financial crisis, Mm. is the introduction of commercial contracts, which means that employees are taken on almost as um, subcontractors. They're taken on as as self-employed individuals, and they lose all of those guarantees. So whereas work has been uh, secure with an employment contract, it's got far more security for the employee. It becomes far less secure if they're working for themselves, ultimately. And in lots of circumstances, these people are doing exactly what an employee would be doing, except they don't have those guarantees. Okay. If we were to think of this in maybe just real world examples, what might a, a traditional job have been with a, you know, a, a previous employment contract? And what kind of, as it were, new jobs are replacing that? Or is it not as simple as certain jobs replacing others? Well, I think what, what we're seeing is that workers, and this is a new term, um, doesn't mean employees, just somebody who, who sort of carries out a function for a firm, workers come in to replace employees. So one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is, is the airline industry, and we mm. see quite a lot of um, self-employment there. Uh, so for example, a number of years ago, um, Ryanair, one of the, the biggest European airlines, um, quite a large majority of its pilots were actually self-employed. So they didn't work for the airline, they worked for themselves, and they were paid as a, an independent contractor by the airline. So this is, this is a job that was traditionally carried out by employee, and with many airlines, it, it, it still is. Uh, you know, the majority of people are employed by that airline. But in this, uh, in this example, what we see is people who are um, ostensibly working for themselves, carrying out the function that otherwise employees would be carrying out. And in that example, how does that work on a practical level? Surely, you know, a, a Ryanair pilot, even if they're self-employed, are they not wedded to that one company or, or not? Well, this is, this is where things get a little bit um, complex. Um, the, the pilot is technically self-employed, so they can work for other airlines. Now, what complicates matters is the maximum flight time that the pilots can, can carry out. So there's only a certain number of hours they can, be, they can be actively flying because of fatigue and other issues which affect then their ability to do the job. Um, so it, it becomes, it becomes a, a bit of a, a gray area because these people are essentially working for themselves. They are, um, they've been paid as, as subcontractors, 
But essentially, they are then wedded to a particular employer because of the number of hours they are flying for that employer. If you think about an example like Ryanair, and it's not just Ryanair, a lot of the, the low fares airlines have uh, particular peaks. You know, they have uh, a very, they're very popular in the summer months, less popular in the winter months. Then, you know, the, these airlines will use their pilots more during those peak periods and less in the, the sort of off period. So a pilot can find himself working, you know, for nine months of the year, essentially, because they've, they've met their flight time, maximum flight time. And we will come back to the airline industry, I promise, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those issues in, in more depth. But you've talked about bogus self-employment and sort of fake or synthetic self-employment uh, in the past. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so this this is an example. In in an extreme case, this would be where somebody is essentially doing exactly what an employee would be doing, um, but because of this replacement of uh, employment contracts by commercial contracts, they are seen as an independent contractor. So they don't get the guarantees, they don't get any of the um, the things that employees would have uh, in terms of you know we've discussed sickness pay, holiday pay, and, and so on. Um, but essentially, they are doing what a, what an employee is doing but they're external, so they're getting none of those guarantees. And, of course, they're under far more pressure because if you are um, self-employed, then the contract can, can end almost immediately. You know, it's, it's, there doesn't have to be any sort of notice period. Um, and so I suppose, you know, using, um, using more technical terms, the, the entrepreneurial zeal comes into, comes into play. So how do you manage people to get, um, you know, the most from them? Well, essentially, you make them self-employed because they, they, they do more because they need to. They don't want to lose that, that job. Would you therefore then describe these people as precarious or is that something different again? No, precarious. Uh, I think insecure and precarious are terms that are used almost interchangeably and, and, and you know, rightly enough in, in most circumstances. I think precarious, a uh, guy standing a few years ago um, wrote the very famous book about the precariat and he talked about a, a whole new class of, uh, of, of people um, as a result of um, austerity and the measures that were affecting in employment. Um, precarious to me it can be used you know I, I use it in the same way you know we are talking about but employees who precarious is, the nature of their work is unsure uncertain um, it does have that impact then not only on their working lives but on their, their social lives you know how do you how do you manage if you've, if you've got a family and you don't know whether the job's going to be there in you know the next day the next week the next month what are some other disadvantages of this way of working um, I guess there there is a loss of control. I mean, I, I talked fairly glibly about you know uh, entrepreneurial zeal. So what do we do? How do we get more for for workers? You know, Marx, Karl Marx will will talk about the indeterminacy of labour power, and what Marx says is you know, there's, there's there's no guarantee. You, you kind of you know effort is something that is negotiated. So indeterminacy of labour power is a major problem for an employer. So I, I said rather flippantly, well, you make somebody self-employed, they work harder. And certainly in the research, I'm sure we'll come on and talk about that we've looked at, then, then that does seem to, to manifest. But again, it does, it, it loses, you know, uh, the firm management lose some control over those employees because they can't leave at any point. Somebody does have choice. And so that is, that is a problem for them. I mean, it's, it's a problem for the employee, obviously, because there's no guarantee. But what we're seeing increasingly as well is what um, Ulrich, Ulrich Beck refers to as um, the Brazilianization of the European economy, where people are doing multiple jobs. You don't have a single identity anymore. You're not, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lecturer. You're not an academic. I think most academics just do that job. That's an unfair, but there are. I mean, precarious working is, is creeping into university and higher education. Hosting podcasts. I'm not being paid for this, by the way. Um, so we, you, the, the, it, we are seeing this thing. I'm, I'm, the, the point I mean about Brazilianization is this idea that people do multiple jobs there, and we're seeing that in Europe. And I remember doing a, a study back in 2012 and speaking to somebody who worked um, for a ground handling firm, so that people move your baggage around the airport. And, uh, and this guy was telling me that this was just one of his jobs. He worked full time, but he was also a promoter for a nightclub, and he also worked in his parents' bar. You know, these mm. kind of three very separate things. Um, so, you know, if you do, if you, you are doing that, it's going to have an impact on your ability to do that, that one job. Well, do you think that's a, I might be jumping the gun here, but do you think that's a model that might be coming to this country in, in a, in a greater way? Well, I think we've seen a far more emphasis on, uh, what is, what is called the side hustle, which I, I really like that term. You know, the fact that you've got, you've got the job and maybe because that job's insecure, maybe because it's not paying enough, you do something else as well. 
Um, and I certainly think that that is on the increase, this, this multiple identity, you know, somebody isn't just one thing. They aren't, they don't have that one work identity anymore. You know, you do what you, you've got to do in order to, to survive and thrive. I think a lot of people listening to you might be thinking, well, this actually sounds like a real positive. This sounds like an advantage to working, having more perhaps flexibility to do different things, to branch out. Do you see advantages in this way of working or for you, is it largely encased in negativity? Well, oh, it's a difficult one, Sam. I, I think that, you know, you can, there's always a positive and, and you know, I, we teach students to critically evaluate. We teach students to think about, you know, what are the positives, what are the negatives? And, and I suppose, you know, you're making a valid point there. This gives people more opportunities. Um, and if you've got more opportunities, there's, you know, you, you lessen the threat. But if you think about the reasons why people are doing this, they're doing this because they don't have the insecurity, uh, they don't have, sorry, the security, because they are insecure, they're precarious. So I think this is a manifestation, not of something positive. I think what we're seeing here is is a necessity. So people doing these things because they find themselves in, you know, um, not a wholly, you know, pleasant situation. I suppose I look at my generation who are far more insecure than, say, even my parents' generation. I'm in my late 20s. But for some people, that does give them the advantage to be creative, I guess, and to work on lots of different separate things and maybe find a, a new career path and a new way of working. But I assume you think for the most, for the most part and for the most people, it's simply a less secure way of, of living. Well, I guess, you know, you, you, the, the example you've given there is, is entirely valid again. You know, the, the fact that it does, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention, I think is the old expression. So, you know, if you are forced in these things, you know, you kind of, you have to be creative. But again, for me, that you know, you may well have some people who are able to to realise um, uh, realize a dream, realize uh, an ambition as a result of this. But I think that's few and far between for a lot of people. This is just a kind of miserable existence. And what concerns me is that we are in a situation where things don't seem to be improving. And given the political environment we're in in the UK, we don't know what's around the corner, but I can't see uh, the economic situation being far more positive anytime soon. You've mentioned Marx a couple of times already. Is he useful in helping you frame your ideas? Oh, he's awesome. Marx is fantastic. In terms of, of, of what I teach, obviously, you know, there's, I, I think the first thing to say is, is Marx is, is normally used in a pejorative sense. So, you know, if you if listen to politics, Corbyn is described as an old Marxist and it's like, oh, you know, we can't possibly take this person seriously. Well, you know, you look at, you look at what Marx has said and you look at the global financial crisis. And what Marx says is ultimately capitalism will, will sort of undermine itself because in the bid to, to um, increase surplus, what does the firm do? It, it underpays the staff. The staff can't afford the commodities it sells. And therefore, you know, the businesses go out of business. You know, that's you know, a basic term. What do we see? We see the subprime mortgage crisis, selling products to people who couldn't afford them. And what does it do? It brings down businesses. So that's, you know, if you apply Marx in that setting, it's a, it's, a, it's a great example of, or great explanation of how these things worked. Marx talks about contradictions, and we're seeing an increasing number of contradictions in terms of, of what um, firms are expecting of staff and what firms are trying to do in the industry. Very good example recently, look at Boeing. Boeing and the 737 MAX crisis. What's happened there? Well, the airline was under threat because a new um, Airbus had just released a new aircraft incredible pressure to, to release a new aircraft right okay i've got to be very careful what i say here I, you know all indications are that there were some issues with that aircraft or particularly with the, the aircrafts that the, certainly the aircrafts that actually crashed so there's a an emphasis on speed to get that um product to market and to do it um in an inexpensive fashion so for example pilots weren't trained i'm not saying this the argument has been made by the um, Airline Pilots Association of the US that pilots weren't trained properly because that costs money. So in order to save, to, to not spend that money, to save money, in order to be quick, what have you got? You've got an aircraft that is potentially problematic if pilots can't fly it. You have a, a series of crashes. I don't know what the future holds for Boeing, but I suspect they're going to be a, a very different company going forward. Marx talks about these contradictions. We've got a very good one there. You also work on the gig economy. Now, that's a term that I hear a lot. I think a lot of people will have will have heard, but probably a lot of people don't quite know what it means. So can you maybe just explain it for us? Oh, I love the gig economy. Doesn't this sound lovely? 
the gig economy, you know, it sounds fantastic. Everyone's a musician. You turn up for a gig. Everyone's happy. Ah, it's marvelous. No, it, it, and you know, when you think what, what this actually means, the gig economy, what it refers to is a lack of security. So people will, will move from job to job. Um, it's particularly, um, relevant when we talk about, um, sort of, um, platform work. So people working in the, um, the sort of software industry, you know, uh, uh, working, you know, Amazon, uh, was it mechanical Turk and other things you've got, you know, people who have no security basically selling their labor for these intermittent, um, non-secure, you know, jobs getting paid by the job. Um, and you know, it's, it's not, it's not a great existence. You know, it's incredible pressure. All the research that, that I've seen is a lot being done shows that the, you know, these people are under tremendous pressure. So this idea of the gig economy being this fantastic, positive thing, ah, oh, just, we, we described it in a previous paper as, uh, you know, this, uh, this sort of unnecessarily positive sobriquet, you know, it's a term that you use and it just sounds fantastic. And when what it means is insecurity, precariousness and, and problems for the workers. So what can be done about it then? If I could answer that, um, then I doubt I'd be sitting here with you. Um, I would be, you know, selling my consultancy to firms. Um, what would you like to see done what, about what it I then, I guess? Say, okay. Um, well, well, first of all, one of the things that's happened in, in at the same time as we've had this um, shift to more insecure working, we've also seen a massive increase in the top 1% and their, their ownership of um, of capital. So you've got, you know, the, the very top earners earning a hell of a lot more as, a, you know, following the global financial crisis. So a more equitable distribution of wealth would be a, a good start. Um, I think that there are, there are certainly positives to legislating firms to ensure that these kind of things don't happen. And, I, you know, I've read lots of things uh, written uh, following the, the global financial crisis, small firms saying they simply couldn't survive unless they had zero hours contracts and they're Example from the gig economy, you know, if, if you had workers that you, you did, you couldn't have this level of flexibility, they would have gone under. Okay, you know, um, I don't know every instance. I, w- I wouldn't like to comment on every instance, but I think there are positives. There are um, what is known as beneficial constraints that can be put on firms. So firms have to respond in a different way. It's not just about cutting the cost of labor, then do something which is creative, do something that's innovative. Um, and so some level of, of security being um, afforded um, staff, I think, is is you know potentially is positive for firms as well as soon as you start talking about control over any firm or company though obviously that means or will usually mean won't it government intervention and that's where it gets a bit controversial indeed um but that having been said you know the government is is there to legislate for society um it, it's it's there to impose controls that are beneficial to us all as you know, I certainly don't think that, that capital should be allowed and, and firms should be allowed to free reign in terms of what they do. You do have very pastoral and very kind of positive employers. I certainly, you know, wouldn't wouldn't argue that toss. There are they do exist. Paternalist firms. But I, I think that you can't just allow that to the individual. That has to be legislated, it has to be there has to be some level of involvement in that. Let's go back to the airline industry. Why did you end up looking at that in particular uh honest answer was uh finishing my master's uh my phd supervisor my master's thesis supervisor has got a long track record in the, the civil aviation industry a guy by the name of uh, peter turnbull a uh, brilliant guy and and just sort of suggested i do it i, I was i was very keen to do a, an ethnography of, of refuse collection because i just loved the work and thought i'd go back and, and spend a bit of time in the bins tell some stories what does what does ethnography mean uh, ethnography is a, is a qualitative research method where you immerse yourself in an environment. So, so rather than, you know, just you collecting data in, in what is a more kind of positivistic traditional sense where you just get the numbers in, get people to fill out the survey, you go in and you, you seek to understand an environment. So rather than test something, you go in there, you explore it, you try to, um, you try to see how, how and why people are behaving rather than allowing them to report it. So you talk to people. You talk to people, you observe people, um, yeah, it, it sounds it sounds a bit creepy. I suppose I know one of the the studies I'm sure we'll talk about with the fitness industry. How I was introduced to personal trainers um, in one gym was uh, this is Harvey. Um, he's doing a study for his university. You know, I was, I was an employee at the time. I wasn't a student. He's doing it, and then he basically wants to come in, talk to you, and watch people. And he was said, in, you know, kind of isn't that creepy? And it was great because you know, it basically, you want to break down those barriers with the people you uh, you're engaging with, and it certainly worked in that regard. 
So did anyone end up doing the ethnographic study of the, the bin men of the refuse collection? Sorry. I'm sure it's been done. Uh, but I, I, honestly, I mean, it would have made for a fantastic book. I don't know what yeah. kind of theoretical contribution I would have made. But some of the stories I can tell you, I mean, it, it, I, I, I scare the children with some of the things that I came across when I was working. Go on. Well, let's just say the things you find in when you're, you're collecting refuse are not necessarily the things that should have been put out in rubbish. So, you know, animal parts, um, the, the, you know, the, the sort of the usual things, nappies. For some reason, animals love, they, they just, it drives them wild, so they rip bags open. So if you've got, I mean, no, you, you have a dedicated collection for nappies, but if you just chuck them in your, your sort of, your bin bag, any animal that's loose will rip them apart. So you have to go collecting soiled nappies. That was an absolute joy. Um, yeah, there was some there was some pretty nasty, nasty experiences. But you didn't end up going down that route academically. You went down the airline industry route, which feels like a big jump, but perhaps perhaps it wasn't. Perhaps there are parallels you can draw between the two. You yeah. tell me. I'm, uh, <laughs> uh ooh, careful what i say i still work with the british airline pilots association so i'm not going to compare refuse collectors to pilots certainly um i was being a slightly facetious when i said about uh, the the airline industry i've got a i think it's one of those industries that's, that's really interesting i mean it's there's so much that happens there it's um i remember one of the first things i read that described it as a sexy industry and i think it still is um you know, it, it's something people can relate to. Uh, it's a great example to use with students. I'm ever so thankful that that's what I, I looked at because, you know, they, people fly, you know, they, they know there's some great examples. You know, you have some real characters in the industry as well. Um, and, and so it was a really interesting um, interesting place to look at besides the fact that I had access to certain, certain areas. But I think that in terms of the deterioration of work, we're seeing that across a number of industries. And the L industry seemed to be an area that was that would have been immune to this because you take airline pilots, they're highly professional people. Um, they're very well qualified and, and they are, the, the people I've met have, have been, you know, just brilliant individuals. I mean, in the sense that they are very bright, um, very witty, very funny, but they haven't been immune to this as well. So they have been subject to changes and then the introduction of commercial contracting. Obviously, there's pilots when it comes to the airline industry, but there's obviously a whole raft of other people, isn't there? And of course, you've got the interesting uh, element of the pay gap between pilots and cabin crew, for example, being one of the largest in in any industry, I think. So, was it in, or is it interesting to grapple with all those different aspects of that world? Uh, just to, just to plug some research, by the way, myself and my colleagues, um, we did explore the gender pay gap earlier this year. Um, and one of the just to pick up on the point you've made there, one of the the it's not something you've said, but one of the misconceptions in the press is that. The gender pay gap is a result of of gendered occupations. So, so okay, why do we why do women be paid why are women paid less in civil aviation? Well, that's basically because pilots are predominantly male, cabin crew are predominantly female. But what we found in a uh, study that was was conducted back in two thousand and fourteen is is with cabin crew alone there does seem to be a pay gap, a significant pay gap between men and women. Um, but there are these these really in, interesting sort of interplays between the you know the cockpit and the cabin, um, the relationships there, how you manage those relationships, you know, uh, questions of control on the flight. Um, it's it's just it's genuinely fascinating. This all happens in a in a kind of safety critical, and when you think about it, you know, terrifying environment. You're in a, an aluminium tube, thousands of feet above the the ground. You know, I, I, it, it just staggers me. I, I'm not the biggest fan of flying, it's got to be said. So um, certainly my, my, my studies in the airline industry haven't been ethnographic. I haven't spent time flying, thankfully, because I don't think I've got to manage that. Which was going to be my next question. How, what, how do you do your research? Obviously, it's not necessarily, like you say, being on aeroplanes all the time. So what kind of material do you work with? What's your methodology? Okay, so I, I'm what is known as a, a kind of uh, mixed methodologist. So I, I will use questionnaire surveys. I think it's limited use. I'm, I'm always a little bit critical of, of studies that rely just on numbers. Um, what I've done in the past is to is to collect that kind of data, quantitative data. You know, look at what it tells you, and then go back and then start exploring it with qualitative data. So go and ask people. You know, the, the study shows this. What do you think? Does this is this a fair reflection of of your experience of work? Um, and so it has involved a lot of sort of qualitative data collection in the sense of interviewing um, focus groups, observing interactions between, um, certainly in the past, between um, trade union officials and uh, and staff. And, and th this can be incredibly telling. I mean, the, 
the difficulty is there's some things you observe that you really would like to report because they are they, they tell you something they're really interesting and you can't because you do have that commitment to um a commitment to the participants and you know if they ask you not to in, you know report something you can't which is a shame because there's some things you see which are just you know again just really 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 fascinating and what kind of information and data are you seeking to collect precisely i guess it's uh it's you're looking at uh, behaviors you look for the reasons for behaviors so it's not simply about um you know what the people do um you it's you sort of you're trying to explore why people behave in a certain way you're trying to understand what it is what other aspects might be influencing something so you can you can make assumptions and this i think is is one of the problems and this you know this is by no means a criticism of all quantitative data analysis but there there can be an issue where somebody will will make a leap in terms of you know what something is showing them without exploring it and i guess what what i've been really interested in is trying to understand the underlying issues there rather than making assumptions about why two variables might be connected it's, it's understanding how people respond to certain things issues and things like like what precisely what exact issues are you trying to grapple with or write about or inform people about when it comes to the airline industry well, as I've mentioned, it is it is about how um, I guess I'm going to repeat myself. What we're really interested in is just to see how the changing nature of work impacts on people, yeah. and looking at you know how it influences working lives, how it then uh, potentially influences um, uh, you know what might be considered um, you know critical um, factors or so safety. If you take civil aviation, safety is is has got to be right up there. And security, you know, think it back to to 9-11 then certainly since since that then security is becoming increasingly important so what we're interested in doing is looking at well what how is how has the work changed and how then might it impact on those things so it's not it's not about calling out particular airlines or calling out particular companies saying well this is unsafe it is about looking at the structures and saying well look potentially this this you know longer term this could be a problem now before it gets a problem it needs to be addressed and you collaborate with other people in other universities don't you Yep, uh, I've got a, a long-standing um, relationship with. Uh, I mentioned uh, Peter Turnbull, was University of Bristol. Um, we do a lot of work today together. We've worked uh, done a number of things. We've worked for the International Labour Organization, European Commission, European Transport Workers Federation. We've done a, a, a lot of studies, and, and these have been focused on civil aviation. Um, and, and it's ongoing. I'm still working with with Peter now. Um, I work closely with um, a former PhD student uh, of Swansea University, uh, Daniel Wintersberger, who's based in the University of Birmingham. Um, you know, but the, the collaborations go much further than that. These are the people I'm kind of fairly regularly working with. And then there's colleagues in Australia, um, particularly with the stuff in the fitness industry. We have sort of ongoing collaboration there. I think it's, it's really important. One of the things that really does... Um, benefit uh, academic staff is, is what is known as social capital and the, the links you create with um, other academics in different institutions in your own institution as well yeah why is it so beneficial to you or in your opinion i, I think it's it gives you uh it gives you perspective i think we're one particular um the, well the fitness industry stuff in particular was really useful I mean, one of the reasons i did that was because i had a, a time I had some sabbatical time to, to research and i spent a long time in the gym so um, you know, it just made sense for me to go in and, and observe. Now, I was making lots of assumptions about the nature of work, and, and you know, I was observing things. And oh, well, that, that's the case. Then the team I was working with, uh, I don't think I want to sound critical. It's not that these people are unfit, but you know, they are less versed with the kind of the fitness industry, and they were asking questions. So it was a great collaboration in the sense that I would come back and say, "Oh, this is happening," and you get somebody saying, "Well, yeah, is it that or is it this?" Okay, well, yeah, and really reflected on that. And I think that's incredibly beneficial, but but also you know when you're working with good people, you can be you can be more productive. You know you can take um, leads on certain things. Everyone's got different skills, um, and it, it's just it just really it really helps you to to get the job done. So this fitness industry thing and going uh, into gyms and doing uh, doing this kind of research watching people in gyms yeah doesn't sure. it sound a bit dodgy it does sound a bit well this dodgy. is what i was going to say on a day-to-day -day basis what were you doing what did the watching people involve? in gyms i was watching I, yes uh I, I like to say i wasn't doing anything in in any changing rooms you know i wasn't observing in there but it, you know on the on the on the um the, the sort of gym floor uh one of the one of the difficulties I've, I've 
um, I've talked about this in a uh, in a chapter, a methodological chapter. And one of the major issues I had was that um, the type of exercise I do is is high intensity stuff. Now you can't observe while doing a session because you're absolutely shattered and you're not paying attention to what's going around. So one of the things he was he was having to adapt those sessions to go in there and, and spend time on my, in one of the the gyms I was I spent a long time on a, an elliptical trainer because he was in a great position. He gave me a panorama of the gym so I could do that, take it easy, look around. Um, taking notes was a problem, as you can imagine. You didn't, you know. Um, one of the things a, a researcher, particularly a participant observer, wants to do is to not be um, obvious. You know, you want to be covert so he was having to nip to the toilet and if you've seen something particularly interesting you run in make a few notes and you know, it might look a bit strange but you know it's it's part and parcel with with research and what kind of conclusions did you draw from that research about work well it was it was an interesting one because we it started off with a with a kind of um we, we want to explore the the importance of aesthetic and emotional labor so okay so how somebody looks and how somebody commodifies their look um, in order to make money. So you think about a personal trainer and you, you, we started from the assumption, okay, your, your personal trainer looks unfit, is unlikely to get business because you're not going to go to somebody who clearly doesn't know this stuff. Um, but what what became clear from, from the study, first of all, um, was that the emotional side of things, so how people relate to clients was was far more important than, than how they looked. In fact, um, a lot of personal trainers we spoke to were saying, well, actually, if you look, you know, if you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, people are not going to want to train with you because you, you you simply look too good. They don't want to be compared to that. There is a threshold. You know, you've got to look as if you know what you're talking about, but, you know, these people who are sort of, that's a term, swole and ripped. I love those terms. Make me smile. Uh, <laughs> these these people, you know, they they, uh, they essentially could be undermining their own their own business because they simply put people off. So the emotional side of things, how people connect. So uh, one of the things we saw, you know, a lot of this kind of, um, you know, oh yeah, tell me about yourself. How's the day going? You know, is it great? And, and I've seen personal training sessions where um, somebody's been there for half an hour. They may have done five minutes exercise. The other 25 minutes were, was having a chat. Now that person is paying for that. But you speak to personal trainers, they say, well, some people, that's what some people want, you know, and it's, it's not ideally what I want. You know, I didn't come into personal training to have a chat to somebody, but, you know, I've got to make money as well. So somebody wants to come in and have a conversation. So the emotional side of thing was really important. But out of the back of that, then we, we started to identify a few, um, a few aspects of the work that was, uh, that made it unique. Um, so you did have this, this kind of, um, the level of effort they made, the, the emotional side of things. And, and this wasn't with clients. This was with prospective clients. You know, one of the things a personal trainer, self-employed personal trainer has to do is to attract clients. How do you do that? Well, you strike a conversation with somebody, you go over and have a chat. You give somebody some advice, you know. Now, all of these things are incredibly beneficial for the gym. The gym isn't paying for them. But, you know, if you, you, you run a gym, you're managing a gym, you're seeing your personal trainers providing what is seen to be excellent customer service, that's just going to benefit you. So, you know, it's... So we started to think, okay, well, what other aspects here? And because of a number of things that came out in the interviews, we started to draw this parallel between personal trainers and uh, medieval villains. Tell me about that. Doesn't sound like the best sort of segue into a in, in, for for personal trainers necessarily, but uh, well, there's a few things that came became obvious um, at the start. First of all, there's the the emotional side of things. That that's that's um, really important. Um, so there's extensive what what. Uh, guy standing refers to as work for labor so people do things in order to get the job done they're not paid for them it's not part of their remuneration but in order to to get the job done they have to do these additional jobs so that's the first thing with the emotional labor and and that's what the medieval villain would have done one of the, the, the sort of the one that made the connection for us was the the payment of a rent so you've got you know the medieval villain would have would have you know um remunerate, remunerate the landlord for the land that they worked they wouldn't have got any income for that. That's another factor. They would have, you know, subsistence farming. They would have survived on what they they made. And when you think about the the personal trainer, they pay a rent to the gym. Sometimes that's incredibly high. Uh, we were looking at South Wales. Now, if you think you're looking at London and other big cities, it's probably far more expensive than that. But in Cardiff, for example, you're looking at um, a monthly rent of around three hundred and fifty pounds. So before you even begin, you're down. That's your deficit. Um, so there was the payment of rent. Um, this extensive work for labor they've got to do on top of um, on the work they're actually paid for. The other thing is the the medieval villain was bonded. They couldn't escape. They were, they were indentured labor, um, tantamount to slaves. 
Um, you know, if you could escape uh, in medieval times, if you if you were a, a villain and you could escape for a year, you won your freedom. Um, it's probably worth saying here, isn't it, that the term villain is not necessarily how we understand it in a modern context. Villain. Yes. Um, I think it's surf. Surf would surf, be the, somebody sure. would, would recognize surf more than villain. Yeah. The reason we've, we've used villain is because neo serfdom was taken and we didn't want to tread on anyone's toes so neo villainy we've used. So the villains are surf. Um, so they are bonded to the land. They, they can't, they're not a free person. In a kind of, uh, not in the same way, obviously, but in a similar way, the, the personal trainer can't survive outside of the gym. We spoke to a number of people who try to, you know, oh, I don't want to pay rent anymore, so I'll, I'll work them out. How would you attract clients? You know, if you're in the gym setting, one of the major benefits and one of the reasons why personal trainers will pay that rent is they get access to thousands of members. So there's a there's a constant um, supply, potentially, of um, of clients. So they're bonded. They're not bonded to any particular gym. They can't move between gyms, but ultimately surviving outside of the gym, unless you've got a, a business model like British military fitness, you know, it's, it's incredibly difficult for these people. And I see how this relates to our previous conversation about precarious work and employment, because if take the personal trainer uh, example, there's no necessarily guarantee of work, is it? And I guess it might be a bit seasonal, perhaps things like that. Well, seasonal in a, in a very unusual way. So, um, what the the people we spoke to uh, were telling us is that you know the new year was a fantastic time. New Year's resolutions, yeah. <laughs> you know, you picked up a lot of business in January. Yeah, you may get some just before the holiday period as well. That would be more of a peak period. But other times of the year it was incredibly difficult. Um, and and when you think about the costs, and this is one of the things we 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 made clear in the paper, and and just to show how precarious this work is, um, the gyms that we looked at. Um, monthly membership in one of those gyms was £35 monthly membership in the other gym was £18 is one of the budget gyms now the personal trainers were charging um, around £20 to £30 per half an hour so if you take the budget gym if you're going to have a personal trainer you have one session a month you've already doubled your expenditure on um, on fitness Okay, so who's going to do that more if people are really interested, they'll be doing more sessions than that, so the, the costs can escalate. So there's a there's straight away there's a um, there's a factor working against the personal trainers because the cost is so high and it does you know is exponential increase if you start you know if you really get into it. I mean I, I had a personal trainer for uh, five years and I was having two sessions a week. You know it's an incredible cost. Um, and the other thing you know you've got that factor first of all that you know it is it is costly and secondly most people know how to exercise. You may not know how to exercise properly and may not know how to, to reach a high level of fitness, but let's be fair, who who doesn't know? You get your heart rate up, you know, you, you stand on a treadmill and walk, you know, you, you, anyone can do this thing. So the, the example that was always thrown back at us was, ah, it's the same as a hairdresser. And we come back and say, well, it's not the same as a hairdresser because if you go into a barber's or a hairdresser's, you can't sit in the chair and style your own hair. I've never seen anyone do that. You, you know, you've got to take the services of somebody. You go into a gym, you don't have to take the services of a personal trainer, and most client, uh, most fitness centre members won't. Yeah, are there any other jobs that are similar, or does a personal trainer kind of stand alone in that way? I think what we're seeing um, these the four the four factors of uh, of neo villainy um, they are becoming more and more apparent. So the work that's been done elsewhere in the gig economy, we're seeing we see neo villainy uh, can be applied to to other jobs there. I think the personal trainer is an extreme case, but there's a number of factors. Uh, one of the major ones is, is necessity. It's one of the few things that it's not necessary. So if you compare it with other areas, you think about the, the Deliveroo driver, uh, the Uber driver, or part of the gig economy, you know, people need the services. So whereas they are, they're still under pressure to provide you know, good service, they can get ranked, they can lose custom as a result of having a, a bad review or whatever it might be, there is still a constant flow of custom. If you need a taxi, you know, you've got to take a taxi. With the personal trainer, it's very different because these people are offering what many people see as common knowledge. It's not, you know, I, I've, I've taken a personal trainer and, and, you know, the advice you get is, is incredibly specific and it's, you know, it's, it's things that I wouldn't have thought of. But most people don't want to invest in that. So that necessity makes it far more difficult. And of course, they're competing against one another. So it's in the, the gym's interest to have lots of these people operating within the gym because they're paying a rent. They're giving them a nice ancillary income. Secondly, they're providing excellent customer services to the uh, to the the clients of the gym. So you know it's in their interest to have lots of these people. But if you have lots of personal trainers, they're competing against each other for for custom. 
So again, you know, you've got that competitive environment. It's, it's a local competitive environment, which is far more for different from if you you've got a platform that's offering work like you know deliveries and and that's not for one not for one minute to suggest that delivery um cyclists and uber drivers have got it easy it, it's not but the custom is more regular than it would be with a personal trainer do most personal trainers just work as pts or to quite a lot of them subscribe to your Brazilian model that you were mentioning earlier where they have multiple identities. Brazil, yeah, Brazilian model. Mind boggles. <laughs> um, we've, we've actually, I'm, I'm actually doing uh, uh, some work with a, a colleague in the marketing section here. Uh, at, the, at the university. Yes, at the university. Um, and she works full time for the university and, and her side hustle is personal training. Now, why I find that interesting is it's, it's hard enough for these people who are doing it full time, the full time personal trainers, you know, without people doing it as a side hustle. You know, that's really, you know, really ramping up the competition. Um, I think a lot of these, the, the people we spoke to would do other things. They would be providing dietary plans, for example. They would do related work, which wasn't necessarily spending time in the gym with clients. Um, and, and, you know, many of the people we spoke to claimed that they had to do that in, in order to uh in order to survive they couldn't survive on on what they get if you think about the labor turnover of, of personal trainers if you spend any time in a gym and i have that that the turnover over a period of a couple of years you very rare you'll see one person lasting more one personal trainer lasting more than than two years you've talked about how you hope that your work highlights injustices and that maybe it might even inspire change and inspire people to change their working habits or or, other, or maybe employers to change their practices. Is that the aim for you? Do you want to actually try and influence policy? You know, I, I think it's uh, Peter Turnbull who I've mentioned as a, as a great line on this. And, and his line is, you know, as academics, we're not disinterested. You know, we, we will have a view. We will have an ideological position on these things. And, you know, what I struggle with is when you're doing this research and you're seeing inequity, you're seeing problems, you know, you, you, you're objective in the sense that you're collecting, you know, objectively collecting data, but it's very hard then to sort of remove yourself from that and say, okay, well, I'm just going to objectively report it. Um, and there are instances, there are, you know, things that I would like to see changed. Whether that's my role as an academic, I don't necessarily believe that is the case. I'm, 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 what I'm here to do is to encourage people to think and present in a certain argument. But that having been said, you cannot do that without a position, you will have a position on these things. So you don't necessarily make recommendations as part of your role to bodies. I mean, you mentioned earlier or big organisations that you work with, like the European Commission. When we when we produce reports, uh, the reports we've produced for the ILO, for the, the Commission, um, they tend to be presentations of, of fact, presentations of data. We The recommendations we've made tend to be for um, for example, um, other stakeholders, uh, the European Transport Workers Federation, which is a, a group that um, uh, represents trade unions in Europe, um, transport workers trade unions in Europe. Um, we tr as academics, we, we're hopeless and we avoid uh, making predictions of any kind. So it's it's more about reporting fact. Um, so again, it's, it's never a case that we would we would go back and say, well, you need to do the following things. It's a case of, look, this is the situation you find yourself in. It's something to reflect on and, and you know, you, you may want to do something about this, but that's, you know, this is what you've got. So again, it, it, it is it is reporting objective data, reporting, you know, factual data. We don't say we very rarely will get into the habit of, and, and I try not to do that in the class. Maybe students would completely disagree with that. You know, I have a position on certain things, but, you know, it's, it's about thinking about it. I mean, you know, kind of, we all know we get a little bit too close to su subjects. It's about, you know, this is this is what we see. We can we can report this objectively. Uh, we can be confident about our findings. What somebody does with those, you know, that is, and again, that's what complicates the impact agenda slightly as well. You don't like making predictions, but I'm going to try you anyway. What do you think the future holds for work, or maybe a different way of looking at that? What are your major concerns or worries for the future? I think that the. I think there's only so far you can take this this model of of insecurity and and precarity. I think it's uh, it it will get to a stage where um, it will be counterproductive. Um, I think that we're seeing that now with um, the increasing popularity of the the living wage. So this is not mandated. It's not the national minimum wage. The living wage it is an optional um, an optional policy, and there has been huge you know sort of 
buy into this um, as a means of, of remunerating staff. And I think that has come about as a result of an acceptance that, you know, it's not just one way, you know, just basically paying people less, reducing costs, labor costs, and not, you know, the only way to move forward. Um, so, you know, how far are we going to go? I don't make predictions. Um, what I will say, I think it, it's, it's always been the case that you will have leaders and laggers. You'll have certain firms that will do things well. You'll have paternalist organizations, non-union paternalist organizations. You think, look at John Lewis, you know, it's kind of the, the, the employment model there has been very positive in the past, probably will continue to be so in the future. Not necessarily that firm in particular, but there will be firms like that. And you will have firms that, that will treat their employees less well. Um, I, I can't see that, that fundamentally changing. Um, you know, we've gone through the global financial crisis and we've still got capitalism and it doesn't show any sign of that changing. So, you know, I, I, I think this will progress, uh, the, the evolution, what direction it takes us in, um, I can't possibly say. The, the John Lewis model, incidentally, being the, the one where the workers have some sort of share in the business. That's right. So there's a, a sort of very well-established uh, employee shareholding policy. Now, again, I've, I've not looked at this recently. It's not an area of my research, but we do use it with students. And this is whereby employees will take, um, you know, a fairly sizable share in the, the profits of the firm, which I think is is only correct. I mean, you know, who's who's selling the products, who is producing the products? And, you know, you, it's the, the people who are doing this should really be getting a, a kind of uh, a chunk of, of you know, uh, of what's being made of the profit the firm is making. If someone's listening to you, uh, perhaps as a young person who's thinking not just about the, the nature of work, but actually thinking that when they do go into their own jobs, they might want to do something like what you're doing, which is your kind of study and your kind of research, how would you recommend they get into it? Uh, well, you know, I could use this forum to say they should study for a master's at Swansea University in management. That was, that was how I got into the, uh, into the situation. I, I think, seriously, it, it's... I think it's a costly venture. Um, if you're studying, a, if you're paying for your own uh, PhD, it's incredibly expensive. It's it's great in some ways. You're never again going to have three years where you basically do what you'd like to do and you're just left to do it. But it is expensive. It's time consuming, and and employment in the higher education sector isn't brilliant by any means. That's getting worse. Um, but I suppose it it for, for people who's for students who are studying the university, if they are thinking about that, I would encourage them to speak to academic staff. That's certainly what got me involved. I was very lucky when I I studied elsewhere. I had people like uh, Peter Turnbull, um, Ed Heary. These are these are you know very kind of you know global names in in the field, uh, and they offered you a lot of time. They talk through the possibilities. They talk through the nature of the job. So I would say to to students slightly different for somebody outside of the university but for students to speak to staff you know have a chat about ideas you know uh, have a chat what's involved i think a lot of people just discount the idea they're desperate to leave you know it's 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 a decent environment harvey that was all fascinating thank you very much indeed uh, for talking to us if you'd like to find out more about professor garant harvey's work then visit his swansea university staff profile page which has a comprehensive list of his publications to find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. And thanks again uh, to Harvey for joining us. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate and review. I'm Sam Blaxland, and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University.